In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about four genera of dimorphic fungi, Blastomyces, Coccidioides, Histoplasma, and Sporothrix. These organisms can cause some potentially quite nasty infections in a wide variety of species, including people and domestic animals. When we call these organisms dimorphic fungi, what we're referring to is their ability to grow in two different forms. There's the mold or mycelial phase, and then also the yeast form. Three of the four genera that we're going to talk about today, Blastomyces, Histoplasma, and the Sporothrix shenkii complex, are thermally dimorphic. So the form at which they grow depends on the temperature at which they're incubated. So our mycelial phase, the mold phase, is between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius. Well, they grow as a yeast at higher temperatures, so 37 degrees or approximately body temperature. Coccidioides species um, do not have a true yeast form in the lab. This is something that we really only see inside the host. Blastomyces, histoplasma, and coccidioides are considered biocontainment level 3 when in the mycelial phase because they are highly infectious, and level 2 in the yeast form. The sporothrix shenkii complex is always considered biocontainment level 2. In the next few slides, I'm going to show you some images of just how different the two forms of these organisms are. So here we have Blastomyces dermatididis. On the left, you can see the mycelial phase. There's abundant fungal hyphae throughout this image, and then the blastospores throughout. On the right, what you can see is the yeast phase of the organism. So these large budding yeast structures that grow at elevated temperatures in the lab or within the body. Here you can see the mycelial phase of Coccidioides imitis. Um, in this image, you can see the very classical uh, barrel-shaped anthrocnidia. So these structures here, these are the infectious stage of the organism. This is what is inhaled and ultimately causes infections. Now, Coccidioides, as I said, doesn't have a true yeast phase in the lab. Um, and so what you can see in this image are Coccidioides imitis spherules in canine thoracic fluid. So these large round structures which will ultimately contain endospores and grow within the host. Histoplasma capsulatum is, in my opinion, the most photogenic of the dimorphic fungi. Here you can see again the mycelial phase with abundant fungal hyphae, and then the two different uh, types of spores. So we have these large tuberculate macroconidia that almost look like flowers or um, sunbursts, and then the smaller uh, microconidia. And then finally, here we have Sporothrix shenkii. Um, on the left, we have the organism in its mycelial phase. Again, you can see hyphae and the spores. Um, in this far right image from the US Centers for Disease Control, um, what you can see is the arrangement of those conidia into these little florets. This is really the classical appearance. And then on the right, again, we have a yeast form, so grown at elevated temperatures. These are all environmental organisms. So Blastomyces dermatididis is found in typically acidic soils, and especially soils near water. Infections are more common following uh, disturbances to the soil, so if there's been recent excavation. Coccidioides imitis is found in the soils of low elevation deserts. Histoplasma capsulatum is found in nitrogenous soils and is really highly associated with bird and bat feces. And then our sporothrix shenkii complex tends to be associated with plant material. So we think of infections occurring following exposure to old wood, rose thorns, or sphagnum moss. Uh, one species within the shenkii complex, so sporothrix brasiliensis, um, is associated with cats. So not only do these organisms have particular types of environments they like to live in, but they have recognized geographic distributions. And having a good understanding of where these fungi are found can be really helpful in coming up with a list of potential differential diagnoses for your patients. In these images here, you can see the distribution of Blastomyces dermatididis in the United States. This is from the CDC. And if we extend this north of the border into Canada, you can see that hotspots for blasto include Swift Current in Regina and Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Kenora, Ontario, which is one of the biggest hotspots in Canada, 
and then the general Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Seaway region. Globally, we also find Blastomyces um, in Africa and South Asia. Coccidioides imitis and Posidaceae um, are found primarily in the southwestern United States. Um, so you can see here this sort of Four Corners region, particularly Arizona. Uh, Phoenix and Tucson actually have the highest incidence. Um, there is also an emerging focus in uh, south central Washington state. Outside of the United States, coccidioides can be found in Mexico, Central, and South America. Recently, there's been a lot of attention paid to the impacts or potential impacts of climate change on the expansion of coccidioidomycoses in the United States and potentially in the further future, um, even into Canada. What the authors of this study from the Lancet Planetary Health um, have postulated is that they expect the incidence of coccidioidomycoses to continue to expand as wetter and cooler regions, such as the coastal counties in northern San Joaquin Valley in California, heat up. They'll get hotter, they'll get drier, and potentially we can have an expansion of the range of this organism. In North America, Histoplasma capsulatum is found on the eastern half of the continent. Its highest incidence in the United States is along the Mississippi and Ohio River valleys, and in Canada, it's found along the southern Great Lakes and along the St. Lawrence Seaway. Globally, we find Histoplasma uh, throughout Mexico, Central, and South America, as well as many parts of Africa, Asia, Australia, and even foci in Europe. Organisms within the Sporothrix shankii complex can be found globally. So Sporothrix shankii sensu stricto, so the actual genome species Sporothrix shankii, is found in the United States, Mexico, South Africa, and Madagascar. Sporothrix braziliensis has a real hot spot in Brazil and is found in other parts of South America, while Sporothrix globosa is found primarily in Asia. Um, now, this map that I'm presenting here is by no means a uh, complete representation of all endemic regions. And if you're interested in learning more about Sporothrix, I would direct you to this really useful paper that goes into more detail about where each of these three species has been identified. Within the genus Blastomyces, we have 13 species, of which Dermatitidis is the most relevant clinically. Coccidioides is made up of nine species of which Coccidioides imitis is found in California and the San Joaquin Valley, and Coccidioides posidaceae is found in southern Arizona and Mexico. Um, the disease caused by these two species of Coccidioides um, is indistinguishable. So from a clinical perspective, there is no difference. There's five species of Histoplasma, of which Histoplasma capsulatum is the most important, and then Sporothrix has many species. Um, the ones that we're primarily interested in are those within the Sporothrix Schenkii complex, including Schenkii sensu stricto, Globosa, and Brasiliensis. Rather than talk about specific virulence factors of each of these organisms and sort of the molecular interactions between the fungus and the host, I thought it would be more useful to describe in broad terms the pathogenesis of these infections. So Blastomyces dermatitidis is an environmental organism. Um, in the environment, we have the mycelial phase, so we have those fungal hyphae growing. We have the production of spores. Um, the spores are generally either inhaled or rarely inoculated directly into the skin. Once they've made their way into the body, that elevated body temperature, so 37 degrees Celsius, stimulates these organisms to convert into the yeast form. Once we have the yeast growing in the body, it can either colonize the lungs and cause a respiratory tract infection, or it can disseminate to other parts of the body through uh, the bloodstream. Coccidioides species also grow in the mycelial phase in the environment. Um, the anthrocanidia are very, very small, so these little guys here. So they can be easily aerosolized um, under windy conditions. Once inhaled, again, they convert into the sort of more yeast form. They convert into those spherules in the lungs. Um, within those spherules, you get the development of endospores. These coccidioides uh, endospores can then disseminate uh, to distant tissues within the body. Histoplasma capsulatum, again, we see the mycelial phase growing in the environment, particularly in environments that have 
uh, bird and bat feces. That's sort of the classical place where we find them. Uh, those uh, macroconidia and microconidia are aerosolized and inhaled by a susceptible host. Once they're inhaled, they convert to that yeast form, which is then able to disseminate through the body through the lymphatics and cause distant infections. And finally, sporothrix. Um, this genus lives in the environment, and exposure of either people or animals is generally speaking through contact with plant material. Rose bushes, sphagnum moss, hay, and dry wood have been identified as particularly at risk products. Um, infection is via puncture wounds, so typically this is a cutaneous infection. Um, this is the case certainly with sporothrix schenkii. Um, we get infected or animals get infected when they have traumatic contact with plant material, while sporothrix brasiliensis tends to cause infections when we are bitten by an infected cat. As far as the types of disease that we see with these organisms, Blastomyces is associated with respiratory tract infections and opportunistic infections in other sites. We can see skin infections, infections of the central nervous system, or bones. Coccidioides imitis and posidaceae causes respiratory tract infections and bone infections in dogs, cats, people, and horses. Histoplasma capsulatum causes respiratory and intestinal infections. And sporothrix schenkii complex typically causes uh, cutaneous infections. We see subcutaneous nodules that occur along lymphatics in a variety of species. A wide variety of species are susceptible. We're going to start our discussion with Blastomyces dermatitidis. Um, in dogs, this most commonly causes respiratory tract infections. So 85% of dogs with Blastomyces have lung lesions. Um, these can be identified radiographically, and most common, the lesions are either nodular or diffuse. In affected animals, we also frequently see ocular signs, so approximately 40% of dogs, and uveitis is most common. Skin lesions can also be seen in 20 to 50% of affected animals, and because this is a chronic disease, we see anorexia, weight loss, and potentially lameness, especially if there's bony involvement. In this image here, you can see cytology of transtracheal wash fluid collected from an infected dog, and these large budding yeasts are really readily visible on the transtracheal wash. Animals who have Blastomyces dermatitidis oftentimes have low-grade signs for days to weeks to months. These infections can have a relatively long period of progression. Um, they oftentimes present to hospital when we have an acute progression of disease, so things suddenly get a lot worse. Um, one thing in an animal's history that should tip you off to the potential presence of a fungal infection is previous antibiotic therapy, so antibacterial therapy, and animals who have fevers which are unresponsible, unresponsive to antibiotics. Remember, our antibiotics are not going to treat these eukaryotic organisms. Blastomyces dermatitidis is seen most commonly in young, large breed dogs, sporting breeds, and hounds, those animals that are going to be sniffing around in the dirt and waterways, potentially exposed to sites where we've had excavation. Um, this is an infection that people can get as well. And interestingly, dogs are thought to be approximately 10 times more susceptible than people. So canine infections can serve as a sentinel for potential human exposure in the environment. In this image here, you can see uh, tissues from a canine lung and these large uh, round oval yeast-like structures, very, very characteristic of Blastomyces dermatitidis. We oftentimes can also see uh, draining tracts or cutaneous infections. So on the left, we have a draining tract on a dog's shoulder caused by Blastomyces. In the center here, we have granulomatous dermatitis, so these lesions on the dog's chin associated with a blasto infection. And then on the right, this is a uh, histology of uh, a canine skin lesion. So we have skin with these large budding yeasts. I think here you can really appreciate this one is budding off. In people, blasto infections most often start in the respiratory tract. We see a dry cough, fever, and weight loss. Um, unlike in dogs, bone is actually the most common site of extrapulmonary involvement. 
The state of Mississippi is recognized to be the most highly endemic region in North America. So for anyone who ends up practicing down there, this should absolutely be on your list of differential diagnoses. And if you suspect that your patient has blastomyces, so I'm talking veterinarians, um, ask your owners about clinical disease in their family members, because as I said, dogs may serve as a sentinel for human exposure. Mm -hmm.